first at four, caught on camera. An off-duty police officer is carjacked at a gas station. There are new developments this afternoon. The arrest of this former school volunteer in Wyandotte has raised questions about how background checks really work. Paula Tubman went looking for answers. And that's because it really does beg the question, who really has access to your children when they're in school? And how are these background checks really conducted? When we went looking for answers, we found a few surprises. And it's not just for some of us. All of us are getting the blue skies and sunshine. There is more rain around the corner. We'll tell you when right now, first at four. Local 4 News begins right now with a breaking news alert. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Drew. Detroit police are offering new information on a carjacking that involved an off-duty police officer. We have surveillance video. The carjacking happened at a BP gas station on Fort Street in southwest Detroit. The off-duty Harper Woods officer was walking to his truck when a man pulled a gun and opens the driver's side door. While the officer throws his keys and gets out, that gunman grabs the keys and eventually drives away. Detroit police chased that stolen truck, which crashed in Melvindale. The carjacker was arrested. And at this hour, there are new developments connected to the case. So let's bring in local force Mara McDonald. She is live on the city's southwest side. All right, Mara, what are you hearing and what's the possible connection here? First of all, Karen, we've got a lot going on right now. Number one, take a look behind me. The chief of police is out here. We're expecting an update from him shortly. But here is essentially the situation. We have got three separate scenes in southwest Detroit that we are all told are in some way connected to that carjacking early this morning. Here is the first scene at around, I think it was probably 3 o'clock near Dixon Lano. You have a situation where police were in some way um, either chasing or following what they're describing as a known suspect, okay? That known suspect opens fire on police officers. What one witness told me is that they heard about four rounds go off. That suspect, that known suspect, then takes off and heads a short ways away to Gartner and Beard, where he dumps the SUV he was driving in. So you have a scene at Beard and Gartner. He is then on foot and heads over to Norman Street. Hold on, Chief is coming our way. Karen, let's hear it from the Chief and find out exactly what the situation is. Stand by. Chief James Craig. Well, we got a lot going on, I can tell you, but let me first just thank the Detroit Police Department. Uh, we, we're going back to 2.40 in the morning, where, as you've reported, there was an off-duty Harper Woods police officer who was carjacked at gunpoint. Uh, we believe there were three suspects involved in that. Uh, the officer's car was taken, and this is when it gets uh, real interesting. Our officers are uh, uh, diligently patrolling the area from the 4th Precinct, uh, observed the off-duty officer's vehicle. Uh, there was a relatively short pursuit, high-speed pursuit. Uh, it ended in the city of Melvindale. That suspect was taken into custody without incident. Uh, the original vehicle that we thought was involved in the carjacking, because, again, it was three suspects, we believe two white males, one Hispanic possibly, uh, our catch unit, our commercial auto theft detectives were recalled uh, during this event. They came in and during the course of their investigation located the second vehicle that was involved in this carjacking from early this morning. Uh, in doing so, they began to surveil the location. Uh, they watched additional suspects get into another vehicle. And from that, this afternoon, uh, they saw the suspects. Suspects got away from them. Again, they were in playing cars, surveillance units. And so the officers continued to patrol, and during their patrol efforts, they saw this same vehicle. And as the officers that began from the 4th Precinct to initiate a traffic stop, one of the suspects in that vehicle, there were two in this vehicle, fired several shots in the direction of the officer. The good news is no officer was struck by gunfire, uh, and those suspects got away. Uh, we did uh, find the location of the second vehicle that these suspects were in, a, a black Honda. So we're sitting on that right now. But we do have information. We believe one of the two suspects that was involved in the shooting today, and I'll give you his information, and uh, he is very much aware that we're looking for him. So my message to him, if he's looking at this, we know who you are, just simply turn yourself in. 
and his name is Kyle Joseph Cherry. He's described as a white male, 22 years old, black brown, five foot six, roughly 230 pounds. And then there was a second uh, male white in his company. So we've identified Kyle Joseph Cherry. Turn yourself in. We're going to give you a photograph of him. But again, I just want to applaud the quick and decisive heroic actions of the men and women of the Detroit Police Department from the 4th Precinct and also those from our commercial auto theft unit. So with that, I'll take any questions. Do we have the photograph we want to give them now? If you can show his photo at this point, uh, Chief, so people that are looking can uh, see the person that you guys are looking for. And talk about what's happening down the street. We don't want to give people, um, obviously, we don't want to get close for our safety, but also for your officer safety in case these guys are watching. And talk about what's happening down there. You believe this Kyle and another man are inside that house? Uh, at, at this point, we do not have a barricaded suspect situation. Uh, there was a lot going on. This was initially a very chaotic scene. Uh, we have resolved this part of the problem, but we do believe that these two armed and dangerous suspects are in this area. So we're asking people to stay inside, let us do our work, um, and that's what we know now. Chief, I was told that this Kyle Cherry has made threats against police officers, threats that he intends to shoot whatever he can and that he, he has no problem if he ends up dying in the process. I'd it, like to know, uh, and I know you don't normally do this, because we're talking about a very dangerous suspect, where'd you get this information from? Detroit Police. Okay, so a source within the Detroit yes. Police. Okay, well, let me just say, yes, he is armed and dangerous. Uh, we have identified him. We know who he is, uh, and we know he is a threat to law enforcement. He has a very extensive criminal history. Uh, in fact, we think this crew is involved in other carjackings. We think the white minivan that was involved in this morning's carjacking was taken in a carjacking the night prior. Uh, we haven't confirmed, so there's still a lot of details that we're not certain of, but we are dealing with a very armed, tense, and dangerous situation right now. You would like everybody to stay inside, and you would in like this us... area, we would like... We want to get that message out, but we want to also give you the picture, and at this point... And Chief, as know. we look at that Thank picture, you. Kyle and this other man that you guys are searching for right now, uh, you believe were involved in this in the carjacking this, most, this morning? We believe he was involved in this morning's carjacking, but we certainly believe he's involved in a shooting incident that happened within the last hour. And that's Kyle, what's his last name? Cherry. Cherry. Kyle Cherry. Kyle Cherry, Kyle white Cherry. male, described as five foot six, 230 pounds, 22 years of age brown hair, blue eyes. So he's not very tall, heavy built, uh, and we know he was involved in today's incident. Now, Turn yourself in. Are there other scenes, active scenes besides this one right now? We do. We can't disclose because this is a very active uh, investigation, and we certainly don't want to give up. Absolutely. Because we don't want to put other people in harm's way. And again, we have a lot of officers uh, deployed here to resolve this matter. And Chief, Thank just for much. people that are just joining us now, you believe that this situation here was involving, um, we thought we were after Kyle Joseph. He's not at this location, but the vehicle was recovered here? Uh, we have the vehicle. We believe he's still in the area. He is armed and dangerous, and he is involved in this situation. So if he's watching this, we know he knows we're looking for him. We are very much aware of that. So just turn yourself in. Turn yourself in. Anybody injured in any of these other carjackings? Uh, not that I am aware of, but this crew has been involved in a series of carjackings. Again, we believe there was an additional carjacking before uh, the off-duty officer. Uh, there was items uh, belonging to that officer, his, his handgun, bulletproof vest that was taken that has not been recovered at this point. Uh, I have reached out to that off-duty officer, have not made personal contact, uh, just to let him know that we're going to work very hard to resolve this matter. Chief of Police James Craig telling us what the situation is out here on Southwest Side. We have multiple situations out here, multiple scenes, and Detroit police officers were fired on this afternoon near Dixon Lanyo, and they believe they've got two suspects on the run here somewhere in Southwest. We are live in Southwest Detroit. Karen, a lot going on. We'll keep you updated throughout the afternoon. Back to you. All right, and as you said, two men armed and dangerous on the streets right now. This is breaking news, and we will follow this very closely minute by minute. Thank you very much, Mara. 
All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Parents in Wyandotte now will likely have a lot of questions for the school superintendent tonight. The district is dealing with the arrest of a former school volunteer on child sex charges. 47-year-old Michael Beebe was approved as a volunteer in the Watchdogs program in spite of having a criminal background with charges that included felony home invasion. BB failed the background check, but according to this letter here that we were able to obtain from the superintendent, Catherine Cost, he actually appealed his situation, was reviewed, and then he was accepted as a volunteer. Now, many parents might be wondering how their school districts would handle that situation. Paula Tupman has been digging into the school background checks and how they work. The question is, who has access to your child at school? The answer is numerous people, from teachers to parapros to custodians to bus drivers to parents who are kind enough to volunteer their time, like Andrew, a parent volunteer at his daughter Cecilia's Troy Elementary School. I volunteered at my daughter's schools for the robotics program. I've been a coach mentor for that. He can remember doing a simple security check, but on second thought, he actually wondered if that's enough. I guess I tend to think of it through my own perspective where I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to worry about, but you know, and you, you gotta take the least common denominator approach and make sure that you're as thorough as possible. Policy at the state level from the Michigan Department of Education states that for all employees, there has to be a state and criminal history check all regular and contracted employees, both full-time and part-time, and they use the fingerprinting process. For volunteers, however, it is different. It's a matter of district policy. It's not covered by state law. Schools can run name-based checks with MSP if they so choose. Basically, it means when it comes to volunteers, the district sets the parameters. The Romeo School District, for instance, uses a two-tiered system. One for paid staffers, which includes the fingerprinting. One for regular volunteers, like room parents, in which the iChat tool is used. The Michigan State Police Internet Criminal History Access Tool, iChat for short, which does not use fingerprints or social security numbers. The Rochester Community School District goes a step further. For overnight chaperones, parents get a deeper dive into their backgrounds at their expense. If we have a situation where parents may be, or guardians may be supervising uh, perhaps a, a fifth grade camp or an overnight uh, field trip, we ask that they're fingerprinted through the, uh, the Michigan State Police, uh, as well as our coaches. Any, any time that someone may have uh, independent supervision of children, we ask that they're, they're fingerprinted. And volunteer chaperones are required to use the buddy system. Well, one of the other things that we do is we make sure that we chaperone in pairs. So we don't, leave, uh, we don't leave people alone with kids anytime. We always try to chaperone in teams. And so we talked to several superintendents from across the metro area, and the hard truth is there is no way to 100% protect your child when they're out of your custody because a background check only addresses what's been done in the past and someone got caught for it, not what they could be doing currently or in the future. The difference with this Wyandotte case is there was a criminal background check, which means uh, school board members have a lot they need to account for at that school board meeting this evening, Karen. All right. Thank you, Paula.